Ciao, welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video today. We are doing another three recipes, all Mediterranean diet, of course, very summer inspired. I'm actually very much was inspired to make this um, whole entire recipe video off of my recent travels to LA. I did a bunch of bunch of research for the restaurants that I wanted to go to as a foodie. That's my thing. I love to go to restaurants and I love to be inspired by menus, by different flavor combinations that maybe I just haven't thought of. So that's something I love to do when I travel. And so these are inspired by three amazing restaurants that I went to in LA. So all of these recipes, of course, because it is summertime, are very seasonal inspired as well as quick and easy because who wants to be spending hours in the kitchen? They are pretty much amazing for meal prep, as always. I'm so excited to share these recipes with you. So let's hop into the first one. The first recipe is inspired by this delicious restaurant we went to in Santa Monica called Bluey's Cafe. And this recipe is an awesome one, or this meal, this dish, because something so popular you're going to see on almost every health restaurant place is kind of a nourish bowl or a Buddha bowl or some kind of bowl which encompasses like six things depending on the restaurant, maybe four or five, six things that kind of complete a meal, but you get so much variety and it's just so fun to eat. So the best part about a nourish bowl is that you get to prep in advance like four or five of those components. So that way it comes together seamlessly and it's the perfect breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So you can switch out certain things in the nourish bowl, like the protein source. You can switch it out for a more breakfast protein source, whether it's, you know, sausage or eggs or something. You can, you know, make it less for lunch, make a bigger one for dinner. There's so many ways to, kind of create the best nourish bowl for your liking. There are basic components you need to a nourish bowl, and this one was called um, at Bluey's Cafe, everything, everyone known as, or something like that. And so the first component to a nourish bowl would be maybe the grains. You'll see either, you know, farro, the most popular one would be quinoa, rice, some kind of grainy, base. A lot of times you will see the substitute of cauliflower rice. I'm not the biggest fan of cauliflower rice. I like actual grains. I think they offer, you can get your vegetables some other way. I think grains offer so much protein, so much fiber, so much, just they're amazing. So I have already prepped the grain component to have on hand. So this is uh, zatar quinoa. So this was quinoa and then I tossed it in some olive oil, lemon juice, a lot of zatar, and then to bring up the freshness and the brightness because grains can be rather bland and they need a little something to bring them alive. So that's why I brought also the lemon juice in, but also some fresh herbs such as mint, parsley, and oregano. Prepped, ready to go for so many different types of recipes, but especially um, for this one, you have some delicious quinoa sash grains. You could, like I said, you could use farro, you could use rice, you could use barley, you could use couscous, sky's the limit. And the reason why I did the zatar spice is because we're working with very Middle Eastern inspired, nothing is really authentic here, of course, <laughs> but very inspired flavors. And they used a chimichurri, which is uh, more of a Spanish style sauce. I just wanted to keep the more uh, Middle Eastern vibes going with the zatar. The next component is hummus. I made homemade hummus because I love my recipe, it's delicious and it's just so easy and you get such better quality when you make it at home. Can of chickpeas, tahini, olive oil, garlic, salt and pepper, splash of lemon juice, there you go. This just adds a little bit more flavor, this adds creaminess to your nourish bowl, this adds more protein as well and just, yeah, overall flavor. So hummus is another great component. The next aspect of a nourish bowl, I always like to include something pickled. Um, I love how it cuts through kind of the creaminess. It brings up like some zestiness. So I made some pickled red cabbage. They had it in the nourish bowl at Bluey's and then one of my favorite restaurants called Brassica back home from where I'm from in, in Columbus. They incorporate this a lot too. Either way, I just love the pickled cabbage. You could do pickled cucumbers, regular pickles, honestly, pickled cabbage. It just adds a little bit more of um, acidic and crunch. Acidic-y? <laughs> Acid, acid and crunch. And, and the best part about a nourish bowl, really the things you're thinking about, of course, are your components of fats and protein and carbs and vegetables. And then you're thinking about colors. So how many colors can I get in? And then you're thinking about textures. I want every component of the nourish bowl 
voice crack of the Nourish Bowl to be some different kind of texture. The next thing is they did a pistachio duca. I don't know if that's pronounced right. I didn't research beforehand. I think it's pistachio duca, which is just ground um, up pistachios, ground up cumin seeds, uh, coriander seeds, sesame seeds. It's kind of like a little sprinkling topping. I made something a little bit different that was delicious too. I just wanted to do something different. So I made some spiced uh, sesame seeds and nuts. So I used walnuts, almonds, and sesame seeds. You could also use pistachios. And I coated it in some kind of flavor that we haven't really talked about yet, which is something kind of smoky and sweet. Here I have uh, sumac and honey and olive oil coating. Sumac gives a little bit of lemoniness. Uh, the smoked paprika gives that smoky deliciousness that we don't really have, like that smoky aspect yet in this bowl. So that adds another layer flavor and then the honey brings out the sweetness and the olive oil is that coating so this is going to be a great crunchy topping you almost want to always top your nourish bowl with some kind of crouton some kind of nuts something crunchy that's a way to get in some fats and some protein as well as more flavor more texture as far as the vegetables go for this dish um, they did i think sauteed mushrooms something i really wanted to make that goes so well with all these components i want something fresh because we have a lot of cooked right now we have a lot of like already made so i want something super fresh and in summertime tomatoes are delicious and cucumber so i'm going to make a super simple just tomato cucumber combination here so you just want to make sure that they're always bite-sized so anything also going to the nourish bowl it's super important to make it bite-sized because you don't want an awkward like you know a way to put it on a fork it wants you want i just want it to be super easy to eat uh, super enjoyable. This is just a quick and easy way for when you have, you know, 20 minutes to put together a lunch or breakfast, you don't want to have to cook the other components for a really long time. You want the other things that take a long time to already be prepped. So this way, all you have to do is chop up two vegetables, some super refreshing, crisp vegetables. So I've got the cucumbers in the bowl. I'm going to go in with some heirloom tomatoes. These are little cherry tomatoes because again, I like everything to be super bite-sized and I also love the color that these give. You don't have to de-seed them. Just kind of make sure that they're all the same size. So like with the bigger cherry tomatoes, I'm probably just going to fourth them to make them about the same size as the cucumber. And then the smaller ones, just cut those in half. I'm gonna toss this in just a little bit of olive oil and salt. Everything else has like so much flavor happening that I wanted to keep the vegetables super simple. So I have a little bowl of my tomatoes and cucumbers here. I'm gonna wipe off the counter real quick. So just a drizzle of olive oil and you're good to go. So I have some kale here that I'm just tearing up into bite-sized pieces. I am patting it, you can use a dish towel, I'm patting it super dry with some paper towels here. And I'm going to add it to this big bowl. As you see, this bowl is filled to the brim with kale right now. So I am going to massage it. <laughs> Massaging your kale is crucial. And add a bunch of olive oil and about a cap full of apple cider vinegar. You're not really gonna taste the vinegar, it just helps to break down the kale even more. Because once we start massaging this kale, <laughs> so really just get in there and just kind of take out all your stress, squeeze it, and go kind of from underneath and making sure that you're getting all of the kale, you're gonna see within like the first five minutes, it starts to get much brighter in color. So when you cook vegetables such as green beans, green beans, green beans, broccoli, things like that, when you blanch them, you know they're ready by how bright and vibrant they get. The same thing with kale. It's not ready raw. You have to do something to it to make it more delicious to eat. So this way, we're dressing the kale so it's not dry and just lit. And we're also, so we're putting a little bit of oil and fat on it which helps you absorb the nutrients even more. Massaging the kale also helps absorb the nutrients even more. It brings out those nutrients, it helps your body absorb the nutrients that come from kale. So we have the base of the bowl, which is grains and green. And then on the base, you layer it. You add your, you know, kind of creamy sauce. You could also, if you don't like hummus, you could use tzatziki or maybe bubble ganoush or some other kind of dip to the bowl, like some pesto, some kind of creaminess. You add in your pickled goodness. You add in your fresh, delicious extra veggies because, you know, why not add more veggies if you can? 
and then you just add in your protein source. Like I said, they used smoked salmon, which I thought was a little strange and different. Um, you could also use, you know, chicken, steak, fish, tofu, um, or lentils if you're more plant-based. The endless possibilities of, again, making this bowl fit your needs. Also, I've been doing this for like two or three minutes. I don't know, I don't, I've lost track talking but you can see that the kale has already gone down in size like a third. A third of the kale has already, if not a half of the kale. So the kale will also get smaller because we're massaging it so it's breaking down. Let's just ignore the kale on the cutting board. We're gonna talk about the last ingredient of this nourish bowl. So like I said, protein source of your choice. I am choosing halloumi today. Halloumi has a very special place in my heart. It's just one of the best cheeses ever. So it is a Greek cheese. Often, majority of the time, it is a sheep or goat's milk cheese, and it is a semi-hard cheese. Halloumi comes in a brine, similar to feta or mozzarella, kind of like that. It's coming in this brine. It's studded with dried mint, and the properties of halloumi make it very searable. So you can throw it on the grill or throw it on a, um, what I have back behind me is kind of like a flat top. You can do a saute pan, anything. And it's such a hard, like semi-hard cheese that it stays in the kind of like a block form. And so what happens is it crusts and gets caramelized on the outside. It's super salty, chewy, cheesy. It just adds perfectness. It's time to assemble. So simple, so easy. Like I said, this bowl is the bomb. So I'm gonna fry up and sear up this halloumi and then we're just going to literally layer everything and plate everything up. the colors, the flavors, the texture. So unfortunately, I wanted a very dramatic like cut into the halloumi, but it had been sitting there for like 10 minutes because of filming and shooting this whole entire dish. So if you eat the halloumi right away, it'll be much more gooey and not super hard, but so many textures, so many flavors, so easy to make. Literally 70% of this is all just meal prep. And then the rest of it, slash staples you already have on hand and then the rest of it you just chop up and toss together fry up some halloumi if you don't have some already protein prepped you have to try this amazing dish i'm gonna eat this and we can move on to the next summer delicious mediterranean diet recipe, the recipe it is inspired by a an amazing restaurant we went to in venice called great white yes great white and i love this recipe because as you guys know i love to share a variety of recipes because the mediterranean diet is a not one size fits all it's a diet meant for whatever you love whatever you enjoy whatever your body enjoys if you want to eat gluten and dairy on the mediterranean diet totally awesome if you don't want to eat any gluten or dairy on the mediterranean diet totally awesome so this recipe is focused on very much dairy-free and gluten-free. So I absolutely loved the dish that I got from Great White. So the base was spaghetti squash as a substitute for pasta, which is an absolutely amazing hack. However, spaghetti squash is a very fall produce, so I'm not gonna be using that today because that's not insanely seasonal. I am going to be using chickpea pasta today. I'm using one of my favorite shapes ever, and I absolutely love chickpea pasta. There's also different varieties of lentil pasta, buckwheat, gluten-free pasta, all many, so many different types. However, the only con to gluten-free pasta is that you don't get that starchy pasta water. It doesn't really do anything for you with thickening and emulsifying that so uh, the sauce that you put the pasta on because it doesn't have those gluten starches. But other than that, it's amazing because it is a great source of fiber. It is a great source of protein. It's just an amazing, amazing invention, <laughs> chickpea pasta. The other only trick and hack to cooking chickpea pasta, in my opinion, is you want to pull it really like a minute before you think it's al dente, before it's ready to be drained, because if you cook it too al dente, it's going to break apart like crazy. In my opinion, it's what I've experienced. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop the pasta. I feel like I don't have to say this, but I'm going to say it. I don't care what kind of pasta you're cooking, never put olive oil in the pasta water. Pasta does not stick as long as you stir it. I don't know who came up with the idea of putting olive oil on pasta water. Do not do that and do not rinse your pasta ever, even if it is the gluten-free kind, um, because nothing will stick 
to the pasta. So yeah, that is just two little tips I thought I'd throw in there. So I'm gonna salt the pasta water and drop it in. Okay, I dropped the pasta, turned down the heat to a medium high because if you have a rolling boil, that harsh boil will also tend to break up the chickpea pasta since it's a much more uh, sensitive pasta in terms of uh, breaking and stuff like that. The next component of this dish that I had at Great White that I loved was the beet sauce. So beets, I mean the color alone, amazing. Beets are, people either love or hate them. People either say they taste like dirt or people either say they taste earthy and they love that. So beets create a gorgeous, vibrant sauce. And so I prepped the sauce in advance. It is basically just a bunch of steamed beets. And for that nutty, cheesy flavor that I love in sauces, I added a lot of um, nutritional yeast, of course, some garlic to give it some flavor, some onion powder to give it some flavor. I didn't actually add in any real onion or garlic because I wanted to keep um, the beets as the main focal point. I didn't want to overpower it with too much garlic or too much onion, um, as well, of course, some lemon juice to brighten it up and some other just simple ingredients to create a luscious, delicious beet sauce. So you can use this on any pasta. You can throw this on some quinoa, some rice, and make beet rice, beet quinoa. Really, it's delicious on grains as a sauce. It is also great as a soup. So there's so many ways to use up this amazing, amazing beet sauce. So I recreated that sauce for today. The very final step to this whole entire dish. There were two toppings that I kind of loved that they put toppings on top of pasta that makes it super dimensional of a dish. It's not just grains and sauce. They put hazelnut remoulade and a herb salad, which was yummy, but also kind of repetitive because a gremolata has herbs in it. So we're gonna prep kind of a combination of the two. We're gonna mix together. We're just gonna make a very herby gremolata, pistachio gremolata. You could definitely use hazelnuts. That's totally fine. I like hazelnuts. I don't love them and I don't keep a lot of them on hand. So I have some already salted and roasted pistachios. That's key to making this gremolata. So a gremolata is traditionally in Italian, it is a three ingredient kind of sauce or a little topping of parsley, some lemon zest and garlic. It's kind of an herby topping because instead of just sprinkling on herbs, you're adding a little bit more flavor and it's often topped on things that have either been cooked for a long time or that need a little burst of flavor or something like that. It's kind of, I say this often, it's something that brings it back to life, like brings the dish back alive. So I'm starting with a fourth a cup of roasted salted pistachios because you want this, the nuts to be ready to eat and delicious. If you don't wanna do a nut, you can do breadcrumbs. That way it's just adding some crunch because we're not really getting too much like really crispy crunchiness. And it's also kind of adding like a meatiness to the mixture. And now I have some parsley and some mint. Those are two of the three herbs that we'll be using today. And I'm just gonna finely chop these herbs as well. And the last herb that we'll be using for this lovely gremolata is some freshly <laughs> picked, literally, um, or just some fresh basil. Just going to give a rough chop of the basil. So the pasta, I think, is almost done. I have been talking. I would be able to get this gremolata done before the pasta is ready, and then we could pull it all together, but I think the pasta needs to be drained because I've been talking too much. Let me speed up making this gremolata real quick. <laughs> you need one large garlic clove. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a big smash. And sometimes garlic cloves, if they sit for too long, they're gonna have a little tiny yellow center to them. That's just because they've been sitting for a while. It's a little bit bitter. So I'm just gonna cut it open and try to pick out that little center so we don't taste any of that bitterness since we are eating this raw garlic. And this is the easiest way to mince garlic. If you wanna mince it by hand, go for it. But I'm just gonna do it through a garlic press. And lastly, we are going to zest one to two lemons. I'm probably, because I'm Caroline, I'm going to zest two lemons. You really, if you want to, you can only do one to really bring back all the brightness, all the summer fresh flavors. All right, I'm a little worried that the pasta is gonna overcook, so I'm gonna go ahead and drain it. The drained pasta, pop it in, and while it's still steaming hot, shake up the sauce that we prepped and pour that right over, just like that. Oh my God, the color is absolutely gorgeous. So I'm just gonna give that a nice toss. How about I zoom you in so you can see the beauty that this is. 
You want to be really, really gentle when you toss it because, again, I don't want to break up any of those beautiful pasta spirals of amazingness. I think we're ready to plate. It is now time for the best part of making these cooking videos. It's the taste test time of the most gorgeous pasta I think I've ever made. Mmm. It's so, so, so good. You have to give beets a try. If you haven't tried them in a while and you don't like them, try them again. Try them this way with some delicious pasta, delicious flavors. This was so easy to make. And the gremolata, like the herby gremolata, is essential. And I definitely recommend pulling the chickpea pasta like a minute before you think it's ready. So that way it doesn't break apart to pieces and it stays in its cute little shapes. This recipe is, is divine. I absolutely love it. The colors are so beautiful, especially for summer. Just such a fun, fun recipe to make. And I didn't mention this before because I was trying to rush to make sure I didn't overcook the pasta, but the gremolata is so good in so many ways. You could throw it on top of a salad to add some fresh herbs and crunchiness to a salad. You could throw it over, um, like I said, pasta dishes, any grain dish. Um, you could top it on top of maybe some like grilled chicken with a little bit of olive oil, like add a little bit of olive oil to the gremolata and like spoon that over some grilled chicken or shrimp or something. Endless possibilities. I'm gonna finish my pasta and then we're gonna make the third and final recipe. The third and final recipe, we are going to make a lemon ricotta pizza. Probably my favorite restaurant of the whole entire trip was Elefante. It was a very Southern Italian, Northern African inspired restaurant with its decor and its menu, and it had the most gorgeous view of Santa Monica. It was, it was, it was a little nice. It was one of the nicer, nicer restaurants. It was spectacular. And I had a pizza, a lemon cream pizza with mushrooms, and I liked it. I couldn't, I loved the pizza crust. I couldn't really taste that lemon in the lemon cream and then the mushrooms were great, but I don't know if it really went all together that well. So I'm gonna make my own version here today. So we're gonna start off with the lemon ricotta base. And this is a pizza that I love to make every single summer. I've been making, making this pizza for like three summers now. I made it summer of 2019 for the first time and then I made it for my birthday in 2020 and now I am making it for this video. I have some whole milk ricotta here. We are going in with about, I would say, one cup of this delicious goodness. You guys know this is one of my all-time most favorite cheeses. And we're definitely gonna deliver on the name here as I am the zest queen. So we're going in with a whole entire lemon zested and juiced. And when I'm in Italy, my favorite pizza there that I always get is, well, there's a couple types, but my, my top one is a zucchini pizza. And so all it is is just mozzarella and zucchini. And I love it. I love pizzas in Italy because they put two, maybe three toppings on the pizzas. They don't try to add a lot to pizzas. They let the pizza speak for itself with the simple ingredients that they add on. So that is why I was inspired to, to, to change the vegetable from mushrooms to a yellow squash. So yellow squashes are very similar to zucchini. You can totally use zucchini if you don't like yellow squash or you don't have any. I just love the yellow aspect as we are making like a very lemony yellow pizza. <laughs> Gonna scrape off all that amazing lemon zest. And then also to the bowl, we are going to add whole entire lemon juiced. Okay, well, this is insanely juicy lemon, so I think I'm only gonna go in with half because I don't want it too loose and runny. So I'm just gonna give that a quick little stir. I'm going to add about a fourth a cup of parmigiano, freshly grated. That just brings out some saltiness. It's gonna help get that nice golden brown color. Next, I'm going in with lots and lots of black pepper. I love something peppery. You could even use chili oil. You could use red pepper flakes. Um, something just to cut through the richness of the ricotta, the saltiness of the parmigiano, and then you have that vibrant, zesty lemon. So we need a little peppery element to this sauce. Last ingredient for the sauce is going to be some fresh oregano. I love, I love, love, love oregano. So I use dried oregano constantly in all my recipes, but I love to bring out fresh oregano uh, during the summertime 
and in a dish like this where you're really tasting every single element and like I said like every single ingredient needs to speak for itself in my opinion and then the other herb that we see often just by itself is is basil um, you know you'll see it topped on top of pizzas and stuff because it's such a beautiful herb it's like a single ingredient on its own i'm not adding basil in right now to the mixture i'm going to add basil to the top of the pizza once it's cooked you should never ever ever um, see basil on the pizza as it that it's been cooked because it kind of gets a little black it gets a little like wilted it loses a lot of flavor it's a very 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 delicate herb but this fresh oregano isn't that delicate it can go inside the sauce and still hold up to its flavors that is all we need for the sauce mixture. I'm going to put this off to the side and work on prepping the summer squash. So I am using a already pre-made crust because I found one that I really love and it makes my life easier. And I just didn't have the time for this video, I'm not gonna lie, to make a whole entire pizza crust from scratch. And mine is actually already baked as well. It just needs to be kind of browned and a little bit more golden. So I'm going to cut, you can even use a mandolin for this, I don't have one, these um, yellow squash as paper thin as possible. You should be able to see right through them and that way these will cook as the crust is getting golden brown, as the cheese is getting bubbly it'll cook the zucchini squash, or the yellow squash. And like I said, I found these imported from Italy pizzas, pizza crusts at Trader Joe's, and I love them. And the other thing I love about these is the little divots that the sauce kind of just sinks into, and it just makes it super duper yummy. I'll zoom you in so you can see better. Okay, so I'm gonna give this sauce a little tiny stir and just do smear on a thin layer. So as you can see, maybe, I don't know if it'll come off on camera, little specks of lemon zest, little specks of oregano. So you want a really, really thin smear. We're making a very, very light summer pizza. And then I'm going to spiral all around the pizza, the beautiful, super thin slices of the summer squash. And then we're gonna do a little tiny dollop on top, last little dollop. And then I'm gonna go in with a light sprinkling of Parmesan just to help make sure that it gets super golden brown. And then I'm gonna take a little bit smidgen of extra virgin olive oil and just drizzle that right on top. So the pizza is ready and I'm gonna pop it into the oven at 400 to get nice and golden brown. So it is time for the final taste test. The pizza looks amazing. This looks so freaking good. Of course, I need to get a piece of fresh basil. It was really weird cutting this pizza because usually I just eat it with a fork and knife, but. Mm. <laughs> I love how I made this pizza because the summer squash still has a bit of crunch to it. They are cooked, definitely, but they still retain that crunch, which is exactly what you get with this, like with the zucchini pizza in Italy. The, the squash is almost kind of meaty and crunchy, but yet cooked, if that makes any sense. The basil tastes amazing. The oregano tastes amazing. I even I was tempted to add like garlic, some other flavors into the sauce, but I'm so glad I didn't because I taste lemon, ricotta, herbs, and summer squash. And that's all I wanted to taste. And they all taste amazing. They all work so well together. This is such a simple, easy, refreshing, light, delicious summertime pizza you must make. So thank you LA for inspiring these amazing, delicious creations. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you get inspired to make some delicious summertime Mediterranean diet recipes. So thank you so, so, so much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, if you got any inspiration to make some Mediterranean diet summertime recipes, please hit that subscribe button and the like button um, and turn on the notification bell if you wanna know when I upload. So you can be the first one to watch and support me because that means the absolute world to me. I really, really hope you try at least one of these recipes, get inspired to live the Mediterranean lifestyle, and I sincerely hope you create a very, very zestful day.
Ciao.